All the living beings that have developed on our planet depend on the only living beings that can regenerate our atmosphere with oxygen. Plants. These beings have marked the evolution of life and continue to fulfill an essential role in a balanced ecology. For millions of years, plants have created habitats in which animals could develop. They are the first link in the long chain of life. But the job of the silent green army that takes care of the planet has not been easy. They have had to develop survival strategies which contain surprising secrets. Evolutionary secrets that guarantee their reproduction. Secrets that make them striking. And secrets that turn them into terrifying traps. Magnificent giants. And hidden assassins. Despite the fact that the secrets behind their chemistry hold the origin of one out of every four medicines that we use, some plants cannot survive on nutrients from the soil alone. They are carnivorous plants, able to create appetizing bait in order to attain food. Their traps are especially designed for invertebrates, which are attracted to them because of their smell and are quickly deceived. This Venus flytrap is very deceptive. It has two sensitive leaves that act like Thule jaws, which close upon their trophies. A relative of the Venus flytrap, the sundew, has a different way of hunting. The glands on its leaves secrete a false nectar that attracts certain insects. But it's over for them. They are trapped in this sticky liquid, just like this ant, which is about to become its meal. Insects are trapped in different ways, according to the species. These nepenthes have a jug-like structure and a lid that closes airtight, which prevents their trapped prey from escaping. Other carnivorous plants accumulate a lethal liquid that drowns their victims, which are absorbed by the digestive fluids of the plant. The opening on the border of the plant hides a trap. The creases make the victims lose their balance and fall into this kind of mouth-stomach cavity, and there is no way out. When they are lucky, their prey are quite large, like this innocent stag beetle, which was attracted by the contents of the dangerous receptacle. Curiosity has cost the beetle its life. In nature, death for some means life for others. Mosquitoes know to wait for the rain to come when these fearsome plants fill up with water creating the perfect place for them to protect their eggs. This is where the larvae of this terrible propagator of diseases develop, under the protection of a beautiful and attractive capsule of life, or death. Plants that have become predators the path of evolution continues to surprise us. The Aquisetum species bring us closer to the primitive plants. 
They have not changed since the distant Devonian era. Their hollow shoots were probably seen in the forest over 400 million years ago. The tips of some of the shoots have a kind of cone with spores that guarantee their reproduction. The Equisetum species have adapted to all the human environments on the planet and have survived to our day, but in more modest sizes than their ancestors. In the past, they reached surprising heights, creating forests alongside the ferns, but today, they do not grow more than one meter in height. The origin of the fern is just as old as that of the Equisetum. The ancient ferns, like the modern ones, were found in tropical areas. These forests in Tasmania, however, are an exception. Here we can find these flowerless plants, despite the harsh environment. They are the jewels of nature that have been preserved intact since their distant origins. It is a privilege to be able to admire them and to see them just as the primitive animals of the earth saw them 375 million years ago. The Christian bishop and the Buddhist lamas crociers were inspired by the shoots of these plants, which are known as crociers as well. Perhaps the priests are not aware that they represent the origin and evolution of terrestrial life. The reproductive spores of the Equisetum are found in small circular capsules on the underside of its leaves. When they mature, they take advantage of the wind to expand their territory, just as they did millions of years ago. Now we are headed for the Nahib, the southernmost desert of Africa. The sandy coast guards a mysterious secret that is only found near the sea. The Wawitsia mirabilis, a unique plant endemic to this surprising desert. Its leaves are like long ribbons, which measure at least one meter in width and two centimeters thick. It is the largest leaf in the world of the creepers. The heat of the sand curls its leaves, which are partially dead and partially alive. Many leaves are buried in its base, protected from the wind. And, although many naturalists consider this plant to be the oldest in the world, interestingly enough, they are related to the conifers, such as the pine and fir trees. In fact, the plant has a kind of small cone whose shape is different, and which is reminiscent of one of the fir and cedar trees. Its frayed leaves look like the tentacles of some extraterrestrial creature and usually absorb the air's humidity in order to survive in extreme conditions. These trees live for a very long time, sometimes even more than 2,000 years. During this time, many small animals use them for shelter hiding under their large leaves, which never stop growing. The Wilwitzia is a prodigy of endurance. It can withstand extreme temperatures, as high as 40 degrees Celsius during the day, and very cold temperatures at night. When the southern winters arrive, it is capable of surviving heavy snowfalls. We are now heading for North America to visit a relative of the Wilwitzia, Although the sequoias are also conifers, they live in a very different way from the prehistoric plants of the desert. They have succeeded in growing higher than any other species, thanks to the robustness of their trunks. At Sequoia National Park near San Francisco, some of these trees measure 120 meters in height. 
The proportions of the sequoias are so colossal that some of the trees have been made into tunnels so that cars can pass through them. A tunnel that crosses through the 3,000 years of life attained by these trees. In order to grow so high and become the highest tree on the planet, a very slow process is required. Another unique botanical adaptation is waiting for us in Africa. The baobab decorate the savannas of the continent. We can find this tree throughout the humid tropical equatorial area, from the south of the Sahara to southern Africa. Africa is the paradise of these curious trees. Here, the trunk of the baobab measures up to 12 meters in diameter, which is very different from other American and Asian species, which never reach such splendor. Its curious shape is unmistakable. Its trunk looks like a bottle, and its treetop is similar to an umbrella. During the dry season, the baobab loses its leaves. Thus, its branches acquire a very strange appearance. They look like roots, which makes the tree look as if it was planted upside down. Elephants like to feed on the branches of the baobab. And if there are no leaves left, as in the dry season, they gouge the trunk with their large tusks, producing deep wounds. They need to separate the bark from the tree in order to quench their thirst with its pulpy interior, where the oldest baobabs store up to 120,000 liters of water. It seems as if the baobab exists so that everyone can benefit from it. Humans use the bark to make ropes and the leaves to make medicine. It is not surprising that elephants, giraffes, monkeys, tree hyrixes, and rodents include this tree in their diet. Even certain birds eat the leaf buds. In fact, these trees are inhabited continuously. Mammals, reptiles, and even amphibians take refuge in the holes in their trunks, while big predators make nests in their cozy treetops or use them as lookout posts. Although its leaves fall off during the dry season, its fruit ripens. It is known as monkey bread and is about 50 centimeters long. Its pulp can be used to make a refreshing drink. The baobab reigns in the savanna. The protective shade of this ancient tree, which provides food and drink for the animals, shelters its visitors during the hottest time of the day, while at its base, life continues its course. If we want to see a giant plant that is able to float on water, we have to penetrate the Amazon jungle. Hidden among lagoons and pools, the Victoria Regia is found a giant water lily whose leaves are as wide as two meters in diameter. Other water lilies can barely support a light jacana, while these colorful water plants can support the weight of a person without breaking. That's a major achievement of natural engineering, given that their rib structure is filled with air which enables them to float. The edges of the leaves are turned upwards and create a thorny fold. Their flowers are similar to other water lilies and give off a pleasant fragrance. These flowers change color during the day. They turn from white to rose as the sun begins to set. Although there are not many of them, they are widely distributed throughout the Guyana highlands, Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil.
we also find the Arisaea species in the Americas. Their leaves are always large, and most of them are found in Ecuador and Peru. This is known as the Santa Soma Mafafa, and its leaves can grow over one meter in length. Large leaf plants like these are used as raincoats or umbrellas throughout the rainforests. They are also used to wrap game and fish, and to protect meat from getting dirty when roasted in an underground fire. Developing such large leaves is one more survival strategy. The plants in the primary forests, where barely any light reaches the ground, have to increase the surface area on their leaves in order to carry out photosynthesis. Their leaves act like large solar panels. The so-called poor man's umbrella is a good example. They are found in the mountainous regions of the rainforests and their large palmated leaves are very useful. Another example is this Brazilian species, whose leaves measure two meters in diameter. These plants are unique because they have thorns on their stems and on the underside of their leaves. This is their effective defense against herbivores. Their reddish flowers form bundles that grow as high as one or two meters. The Arisea have spread in a spectacular manner, but their diversity reigns especially in South America. The jungles of Indonesia and Malaysia are home to one of the largest flowers in the world. a species that grows at ground level that needs to parasitize other plants since it doesn't have roots. The Rafflesi Arnoldi has the record in diameter of all flowers, no less than a meter. Although this is not the case of this plant, which is at the end of its life, it has fulfilled the cycle that the ecosystem has forced upon it and there is nothing left of its wonderful splendor as the giant of all flowers. Nature imposes its rhythm of death and renewal. In fact, these globular bulges are new plants being born. In just a few months, their attractive colors will emerge again. But this could never happen if the insects that consume the dead plant did not transport its pollen. It is a natural cycle that unites death with life. The Cactaceae are from the Americas. Here, they have developed such a variety that there are more than 2,000 species. These prickly plants have expanded their empire from Canada, across the North American deserts, to the south of Argentina and Chile. Their form of defense is quite evident their large thorns discourage most herbivores, although these defenses vary, just like their distribution. The cacti are living canteens. In the areas where water seems non-existent on the surface, these plants are able to obtain it from condensation at night and from their deep roots, which pump the water into their interior, where it is stored in their trunks. A 
On the Galapagos Islands, there are authentic cactus trees. Their flowers, prickly pears, and stalks serve as the basic food for land-based iguanas. It is surprising that these prickly spines do not cut the lizard's mouths. The labial scales round over their chins so they can slide better and do not get stuck. The abuses of collectors and traders have placed the most striking species of cacti, these wonders of survival, in danger of extinction. We have found species able to live on the rough and uneven terrain of black lava and volcanic rock. It seems amazing that they can live in such a harsh environment, but they are able to obtain the minerals they need directly from the rock, the dew, and the scarce rain. Their colors stand out like the brushstrokes of an abstract painting on a black canvas of rock, which was once red hot, and an unpolluted blue sky of a naive painting. In the Amazon, there is a cactus called the San Pedro that is highly valued by the shamans. It is used to cure many different ailments and can be combined with other plants. To do so, it is boiled or soaked in alcohol. It can also be eaten directly. Like peyote, it is a strong hallucinogen. If the proper dose of the toxin is not taken, it can kill the person who consumes it. There are some cacti that parasitize trees, like this interesting Costa Rican species, whose stalks grow by squeezing and coiling around the trunk and branches. In these strange bulges, water is stored. Once they have overgrown the thick branches that they parasitize, they fall like a pendulum until they find a new victim. Like the rest of the cacti, their thorns are their best defense. This original species evolved and adapted by opening a path to light in order to survive among the tangled vegetation of the forest. The Euphorbiaceae are a group of plants whose appearance is similar to that of the cacti, and sometimes it is hard to differentiate them. Some species have a white latex sap that can be deadly. Mysterious forests exist between the sea and the land. Mangrove swamps are authentic laboratories. These trees are found in estuaries. They are the only trees able to live in salt water. If we look closely at their roots, we can see that the trunk rises from the roots and not directly from the ground. The branches emerging from the earth create natural lungs which are called pneumatophores. They rise from the ground above sea level to obtain oxygen. These aerial roots do not get wet when the tide rises, and so they store the oxygen the tree needs and deliver it to the roots. The salt is filtered in the cells of the leaves. They release the salt through the branches. Certain glands perform the job of eliminating the salt absorbed through the roots, where up to 35% of the salt is concentrated. Another peculiarity is its viviparous reproduction. The seedlings, which can measure as long as one meter, 
are so developed when they fall from the parent plant that they are ready to become a tree. Because of their weight, they plunge to the ground and take root in the soil, where they begin to produce leaves. More than just seedlings, they are complete plants. Some fall when the tide is high and are carried away by the sea until they eventually run aground and take root. Mangroves cover large coastal areas in most of the tropical regions. They contribute plant material that creates soil and food for themselves and other living beings. When the ground is drained, new territory is won from the sea. Their tangled and labyrinthine root structure is a natural wave breaker, while the soil is protected and remains intact, forming a good refuge for many species. The mangrove goby lives on its shores. Its interesting adaptation to be able to leave the water has made it almost amphibian. It moves across the land with ease. These males open their colorful back fins in order to seduce the females. Many species of fishes lay their eggs among the mangrove roots. The young fish are concealed during a long period of time until they are able to enter the ocean on their own. And this attracts many predators, even sharks. The mangroves are a paradise for crabs. They feed on the microorganisms and plant material that falls into the water. They transform it into a thick mud, which is made up of their excrements. Their large pincers are flag signals that attract their females and warn off opponents. As the mangrove matures, the life forms become more complex. Mollusks, jellyfish, sea cucumbers, starfish, sponges, actinae, algae, and even the great manatee which is in danger of extinction, are all attracted by this labyrinth of roots. These trees are inhabited by both snakes and small lizards, like this anoli, and big crocodiles, which are highly aware of the many birds sitting on the treetops. All they have to do is wait for a bird to lose its balance and fall into the water. Komodo dragons search for possible prey near the roots. Monkeys have taken over the treetops in certain areas, like the scarce and strange proboscis monkey and the bonnet macaque. Far away in Cuba, the Jutia is found, a very large tree-dwelling native rodent that feeds on the leaves of the mangrove. The branches of the mangroves offer shelter to many species of birds. Some travel far to nest in their treetops. Even predators such as the common black hawk, the osprey, and the turkey buzzard or turkey vulture. Large birds like the pelican, roseate spoonbill, cormorant, anjinga, gray heron, red-headed ibis, black-headed ibis, and various species of storks and egrets create large platforms for their nests by using the branches of the mangrove tree. These extraordinary plants should be protected, but this is not always the case. In many places, they are felled for their hard wood. Then the area is turned into shrimp farms, which are eventually destroyed by the tides since they are left unprotected. Another extraordinary and ancient plant is the palm. There are about 2,600 different species of palms distributed throughout the tropical and temperate areas of our planet. Their cylindrical trunks are wider at the base and may be smooth or have bulges where the leaves grow and fall from the bark every year. The bark is not really bark, but a weave of close-knit fibers. Some are highly protected by sharp thorns, like this Amazonian palm. 
Others, however, protect their leaves. Some have leaves that measure up to 15 meters in length. It is interesting to note that their strong leaves grow from tender shoots, which are often consumed in salads. The spandexes make up the floral clusters. When they mature, they become fruit. Their length varies from barely 60 centimeters to 6 meters. Some species of palm can produce about 60 million flowers, which parrots are very fond of eating. These weaver birds have used a date palm to make their nest. But they are not the only ones that make use of the palm trees. We humans obtain oil, wax, fruit, fiber, and wood from them, and use the leaves of some species to make roofs. In Djibouti, on the Horn of Africa along the Red Sea, we find Ibrahim cutting leaves from this palm tree in the desert. He is trying to cut it in order to extract the sap, which he uses to make a prize liqueur. The oil palm measures 15 meters in height and is one of the most valued palm trees in the world. Native to Africa, it is now cultivated throughout all the tropical areas. It was transplanted to other continents and man has obtained many benefits from it. Unfortunately, thousands of hectares of beautiful tropical forests are cut down and destroyed in order to cultivate this one species. Where up until now there was exuberant biodiversity the most fertile and varied ecological land environment on the planet has become immense expanses of this monoculture. One of the most renowned species is the coconut palm, which comes from the Pacific and Indian Oceans. It extends along the coasts and tropical equatorial areas, this plant has a unique system of colonization. The well-known coconuts are great navigators and were designed by nature to handle the roughest seas and the worst hurricanes. They can keep afloat until a friendly wave deposits them on a warm, sandy beach. Sometimes, unsuspected passengers are found inside it, stowaways that travel from the continental shores to the most remote islands. When they adapt to this new environment and evolve, separated from their ancestors, they create new species. Their outer covering is a fine, smooth skin with a fibrous tissue inside, which protects the nut. This skin is used to make diverse ornaments and containers. When the seed is partially buried in the sand, its protective framework begins to decompose. This opens the path to the phenomenon of life, and its disintegration becomes the first food for the root. Meanwhile, the first leaf begins to grow until it becomes a beautiful and flexible tree. The coconut is highly valued all over the world. A refreshing drink is obtained from it, as well as the copra which has been the object of intense trade. Copra is the white flesh inside the coconut. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was known as green gold or white gold because it led to major trade wars. Once it dries in the sun, it is distilled in order to obtain coconut oil. Shredded coconut is highly valued 
and used in the cuisines of many countries. Finally, the waste material is fed to livestock and the shell is used as fuel. All of this comes from a slender palm tree whose silhouette makes us dream of paradise. In the jungle, we find plants that kill their host plants, a kind of organized crime that is found in all the tropical forests. Strangler vines like the Apui are able to choke gigantic trees to death. Its trunk grows disproportionately around the trunk, like a deadly spiral that slowly climbs up the tree. The death of its victim is not as fast as the death of a snake's prey. But it is clear that its lifetime is also different. It is much longer. The tree continues to develop while its parasitic assassin grows faster and strangles it to the point of drying it out, leading it to its complete destruction. Sometimes they take their victim's place in the forest. Some species are even able to wait hundreds of years to achieve this. Water is super abundant in American forests, although it can become a deadly trap for humans because of lethal microorganisms. In this green hell, or earthly paradise, depending how you look at it, there is a vine that the Quechua's call Yaku Uwaska, a rope of water. It acts as a natural filter in such a way that it stores clean, transparent water in its trunk. The stems of some of them can be used like ropes, which can even be tied together to create a more solid and higher shelter in the treetops, such as the one this Zoe tribe member is making. There are vines that have curative and toxic components. Some African lianas are used as medicine, condiments, and hallucinogens. The most renowned hallucinogenic plant is the ayahuasca, a Quechuan word that means rope of death. The indigenous people consider it a sacred plant. Its main active component is telepatina, a substance that can be lethal. By taking it, they claim to travel to the afterworld to contact their deceased ancestors and to find the answers to an infinite number of questions about disease and events that have taken place. Most of the Amazon tribes use it for spiritual health and bodily hygiene. They drink the potion as an emetic and expel the poison in a purification ritual in order to cleanse their interior. An overdose is deadly, and only the shamans know how to control it. There are some shamans who play jokes on overly curious people who don't show the proper respect. They make them go crazy for days, or even months. Its consumption has cost many human lives when it has been handled by phony medicine men, and when Westerners experiment with the drug without knowing the proper dose to take. The shamans say that it should be taken in the company of others, in case it produces a bad trip. They conduct the ritual and provide another substance that counteracts the effect of the poison. In Brazil, a religious sect has emerged in relation to the rope of death, and there are more followers every day. The members believe in its supernatural and curative powers, they come together in groups that are headed by a visionary leader and a shaman 
who accompany the participants in order to help them during a bad trip. In Venezuela, the Sanema people consume a resin called sacona, which they extract from the bark of the yopo tree, which the indigenous people call amaha. They cut the bark into strips during a special ritual. Then they spit in its interior to scare away the bad spirits. Finally, the resin surfaces with the heat of the flames. They extract the resin by pushing it out with their fingers and place it in a container, where it is boiled until it is completely dehydrated. Then it is made into a powder and inhaled through the nose. It rapidly begins to affect the brain. They believe that in this way they can contact the spirits of their ancestors and the forest gods in order to see the future or the past, see where to find game, or discover the evil that a sick person is suffering from. This is a dangerous trip given that these drugs alter the neurons in the brain. The Sanema also use another, less harmful drug, the tobacco leaf, whose main alkaloid is nicotine. It is cut with ashes and used to stimulate the nervous system. The Sanema place these balls of leaves between their lips or in their cheeks for a very long time. They provide minerals from organic acids which facilitate digestion and complement their scant diet. They also rid the body of internal and external parasites while at the same time frightening off evil spirits. Many multinational pharmaceutical companies know that the forest has hidden treasures among its plants. They try to obtain this traditional knowledge from the indigenous people while giving nothing in exchange. The verbascum, or huasca barbasco, is a leguminous plant used in the Amazon to kill the fish in small pools, since its toxic component suffocates them. The Sanama people of the Venezuelan forests have gone in search of these plants. The forest provides them with what they need. They cut down a tree and use it as a mortar. They cut off the branches and make them into clubs. They use the clubs to pound broken fragments until they are made into a kind of scorer. This is how they remove the rotenone contained in its sap, a poisonous substance with neurotoxic effects. The branches are cut and joined together in small bunches and carried to a nearby stream. Here, they are placed in the water and shaken to release the deadly poison. All they have to do is patiently wait to collect the harvest of the dead fish. In a few minutes, the fish are paralyzed, open-mouthed, and belly up on the surface. For the inhabitants of the forest, they are a necessary source of proteins. They know that the verbascum poison is not active when they take it orally, a conclusion reached after continually observing nature over thousands of years. This net is made out of plant fibers, and the ring that holds it open is a flexible branch. The improvised receptacle is simply a large leaf that is properly folded so that their prey cannot escape. We still have a lot to learn from these wise, natural peoples. Once again, we are headed back to Africa, to the Kalahari Desert, a land that is inhabited by wise, hardy, and kind-hearted men. They have a very developed sense of the desert in which they live, and they do not have a very hierarchical social structure. 
The Bushmen know their environment very well. They are provided with what nature gives them. They know how to get food from edible plants, like these berries rich in vitamin C. And they also know how to use the poisonous ones to their advantage. They gather the deadly root of the Kamarungarunga, the larvae of the poisonous Colapteron, and the dangerously toxic root of the Sanseveria. This is all blended together in an improvised receptacle. In this case, they are using one end of a giraffe's tibia bone. They extract the poisonous juices from the larvae and add the root extract by chewing it. Then they spit it out over the deadly contents. Once the poison is compounded, they carefully spread it on their arrows to make use of its lethal effects. This operation must be carried out with extreme caution. If they were to cut themselves on an arrowhead, or if the mixture were absorbed through a wound, they would die. They load poison onto their small arrows, which look inoffensive, so that they have the power to kill large animals, like an elephant. These friendly and small inhabitants of the desert are able to find water where apparently there is none. They know how to look for natural wells by digging up this precious treasure. It is known as the koa, an enormous bulb that they dig out of the earth. They clean it, they cut it into equal proportions, and they divide it up fairly. It is a tonic from which they obtain the necessary liquid in order to be able to continue their journey through the desert. The bue is another tuber. They carefully and insistently grate it. They obtain a liquid by squeezing the shavings and drink it to refresh themselves so they can continue on their journey more comfortably. Their talent for making fire is truly incredible. They add a little resin to a soft branch and then rub it with a piece of harder wood until it gets hot. When grass is added, fire is miraculously produced. They know about cannabis, the most common drug in Africa. It is used all across the continent from the north to the extreme south, where the Bushmen live. They smoke joints rolled up in bark. Meanwhile, they observe the shaman who devotes himself to interpreting the wooden runes. Inspired by the drug, the shaman will tell them where they should go to find game. When night falls, they will perform dances to assure their success while hunting. Most of our diet is made up of healthy plants. We can see this simply by visiting the markets around the world, like those in Africa, Indonesia, Brazil, Peru, Mongolia, and New Guinea. We can see sacks of colorful spices and colorful baskets and fruit that are artistically placed on the ground. In these places, we find everyday food that is characteristic of each region. Vegetables form an important part of the diet of the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. 
in the Amazonian villages, many different kinds of flavorful fruit can be admired. In Eastern markets, exotic fruits and vegetables are mixed with more universal ones. In Western markets, fruits and vegetables are winning back more followers day by day, to the detriment of meat. This Chenka woman in Ethiopia is showing the results of her work. Cotton forms part of our daily life, since most of the clothes we wear are made from this raw material. Primitive distaffs, a universal invention that changed our attire completely, are used by women all around the world. Some people respect certain vegetables because they are considered sacred. This giant thavia, or silk cotton tree from the Ivory Coast, is the symbol of longevity and fertility. Without forgetting to give Mother Earth her portion, the warriors drink from its base to obtain its powers, while accompanied by their elderly, the shamans and leaders. Experts from around the world are working together in the Brazilian Amazon and in the Costa Rican forest to conduct research into the many unknown aspects of how the forest works, the interconnection of all its living beings, their individual functioning, and their growth and development. They even measure how much oxygen and carbon dioxide the plants breathe, the humidity they need, and how much they give back to the environment. This research is extremely important to achieve a better understanding of the complex relationships between all living beings, and of the highly complex framework that maintains life's equilibrium. Their studies are showing that deforestation is affecting the entire planet. It is possible that many species will disappear before they are even recorded. This loss of biodiversity is also the loss of many possibilities for our own species. Frequently, new plants are discovered, like some of these orchids, whose interesting biology still abounds with many unsolved mysteries. Let's take a look at the archer orchid, one of the most distinguished cases of pollination. Its labellum, or lip, is a landing field for insects. When trying to drink from the plant, insects touch the masculine anther, which catapults out over the pollinator. With this double contraption, the orchid's pollen gets stuck to the host's back, in this case, the botanist's finger. We need to be aware that making use of nature should not be synonymous with destroying it or using it up. Present and future politicians and businessmen should take emergency measures because otherwise we will drown in our own selfishness, ignorance and waste, which is increasing every day, and substituting such beautiful species as those we have just seen. In some places, the air is no longer even breathable. The water we need in order to live is being contaminated daily and at a rapid pace. It is not just your imagination that many species are becoming extinct or that the climate is changing. In a few years, the water level will rise, causing irreparable damage to the coastal regions, and many will disappear. The countdown has begun, and the water is rising. Will we have the good sense to solve this problem? Or will the few individuals who are completely blind, selfish, ignorant, and mad have more say about the global disaster that is coming?